I was blown away. Brent Olsen's here. This is awesome. I didn't know he was here. Huh? No, I know.
trouble with our microphone, and I thought, the first thing I thought was Ben Bernanke got to it. <laughs> But it is a delight to be here. What a wonderful crowd. Uh, there's a little pamphlet on your uh, on your seats, I believe, and it comes from my wife. It's called a cookbook. What in the world do you need a cookbook for? Uh, it's just tradition. I've done, used it in campaigns before. It's just to introduce you to our family. It's a picture, picture of the kids and the grandchildren. We have five children, 18 grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. So it's just an introduction that my wife likes to say on. Uh, but we don't guarantee, uh, we guarantee that the recipes are good, but not necessarily all, uh, we don't count calories that carefully when we send out a cookbook <laughs> to enjoy. But anyway, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we have been very busy these last couple of days, and we've been very encouraged. Has anybody noticed that the polls have changed in this significant way? Yeah.
think it is for most people, is to uh, seek virtue and excellence, to try and improve ourselves and try to be more excellent and to, to uh, search for truth and, and try to get truthful answers on how the world works and how the politics works and how economics works and how foreign policy works. But when governments take over that role of trying to impose on you virtue and excellence, there's no freedom left. Believe me, they become judgmental. They decide what your habits should be, or they decide how you should spend your money. Freedom is one issue. It brings people together. Personal liberty and economic liberty are one and the same. It is based on the fundamental fact that we have a right to our life, we have a right to our liberty, it's natural, it's God-given, and it follows that we ought to have a right to keep the fruits of our labor. Yes. But today, our fruits of our labor are under attack. Matter of fact, wealth is under attack. It's been under attack for many, many decades. And there's been a transfer of wealth from the middle class to the wealthy. This is characteristic of the debasement of currency. If you had nothing else other than devaluing the currency, and, and like what the Federal Reserve does, there is an automatic transfer of wealth from the middle class to the wealthy. And the middle class shrinks. Everybody knows the middle class is shrinking right now. Is Wall Street suffering? Are the banks suffering? What happens when the crisis hits? Congress rushes to vast peel bills and uh, bail out the banks, bail out the people who have been ripping us off, and then at the same time, uh, the people who have to assume the debt that they have run up are the people. We buy that bad debt, the people own the debt, it doesn't allow the correction to occur, and the middle class gets smaller, they lose their jobs, they lose their houses, so all these fancy housing programs and all that excessive credit that was supposed to give everybody a house ends up in a disaster with uh, people losing their jobs and losing their houses, so wealth <coughs> keeps shrinking. So there's a couple things offered. Uh, some say, well, what we have to do is raise taxes. There's a few people still making money, we have to tax them and then that'll solve the problem. And some people say, well, yes, if they make money, they have the money, we have to tax them. But there are two kind of people that still have the money. There's one kind that give us an honest product at an honest price and we make them rich because we like their products. If you like their electronics and you buy them and they haven't been, uh, and they haven't been bailed out by the government and they don't get government contracts, that's one thing. But if you're rich because you belong to crony capitalists and that you're on the take and you get the contracts and you have your lobbyists going to Washington and you're controlling everything, that's quite a bit different. I don't think we should just tax those people. We should take away all their subsidies so that they don't have this ill-gotten wealth. Yeah. worth of our debt. 
We can't afford it. If you think we should be doing that, that's one thing. But on the side of the, uh, uh, the, the limited fact is that we can't do it anymore because we can't even take care of our people at home. And we don't have the jobs and the wealth is gone, but we need to get our jobs back. But just to say that, uh, that, that we can continue to do this is impossible. We cannot. We will eventually crash our economy a lot worse than it is now. We can't keep you know, bailing out the special interests at the expense of the middle class because eventually it leads to a lot of anger, a lot of people upset, and that is what I fear. I think that is coming, and if we don't understand this and what we need to do and know who the individuals are who are taking the advantage of it, it, it could get worse. So my goal is, of course, to try to work our way out of this to prevent the violence in the streets. There are already violence in the streets in Europe. We can see it. People are very annoyed and they don't understand it. And yet we're, in, we're involved in the Europe bailout to the trillions of dollars. We already did it in 08 and 09. But it was done secretly by the Fed. It was done by the Federal Reserve. And the Congress has not yet gotten hold of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is so important because it allows big government to grow uh, and, and, uh, and get out of control. So some people want to spend money on weapons and some people want to spend it on welfare benefits. They get together and they spend money and they say deficits don't matter. And then they say taxes until there's no more people to tax. They borrow until the people, uh, until interest rates go up. Then what do they do? They just print the money. And then we wonder why we get into this trouble. We finally have a bubble at first. We're all in trouble. So the problems came from too much spending and too much borrowing and too many regulations and too many taxes and, and uh, too much printing money. So what do they do? They print more money. They tax more money. They print more money. I mean, they continue to do the same thing and more debt, and the debt explodes. You can't solve a problem like that. If a person has cancer, give them another cancer. really doesn't solve the problem. And economically, that's about what we're doing. So we have to wake up and, and, and have some common sense about this. So my proposal, since I think spending is the problem, the spending is the big problem, and it's going to, and the spending helps the wrong people, and the middle class pays for this. So I think we have to cut the spending. I want you to have more money, more money to spend. You should be spending the money. I know a lot of bureaucrats, and I've met a lot of politicians in the last couple decades. And let me tell you, I can assure you, they do not know how to spend your money. You should spend your own money.
So to start on Social Security and health care for the elderly or health care for the indigent children, that is not the place to start to balance the budget. Matter of fact, what we should try to do is cut some of these other programs in order to tie people over until we come up with a better program than assuming that the government can always take care of. So cutting overseas spending should be one of the easiest things that we can do. But the other thing, we'd have to cut some things at home with with the protection of certain programs. Or some, in, my, in my proposal, there's some protection for health care benefits and uh, also some educational benefits. But it's really a shifting here and a shifting in attitude and recognizing that we have to cut back. So I have five departments that uh, I would cut and get rid of. I would go back to 2006 budgeting, which is not, ex the government wasn't extremely small at that time. A lot of us thought it was way too big in 2006. But it would save a lot of money just going back uh, to, to that baseline. And you can cut a trillion dollars in three years, the budget would be balanced. But it would send a strong signal that we're getting our house in order and our finances in order. Uh, we've already had one downgrade of our of our credit rating, and another one is on its way. And if we pursue and are determined that we're going to use dollars uh, forever to bail out Europe, and our banks are intertwined with all the European banks, the banks in Europe bought all the debt from, or not all, but a lot of the debt they hold is Greek debt and Spanish debt and Italian debt. It really probably is either worthless or 50 cents on the dollar. But who's going to suffer if we don't bail out? The banks are going to suffer. But if they bought that debt, they're the ones who are supposed to suffer. You're not supposed to have to bail them out. <laughs> That'd be a, a way to get back. The signal could be sent that, that uh, our finances would be handled differently. But I think we send, need to send a very strong signal to the world that our foreign policy is changing. I've had a very modest suggestion that I have made that, that we ought to talk to company, countries before we bomb them, you know, just communicate with them. And, and that might be, you know, a radical uh, idea. But the reason I have this idea is because I lived through the Cold War in the military. I was in the military during the 60s. Uh, 62 I was drafted during the Cuban crisis. That was resolved rather quickly, but then I was in later on for a total of five years. But during the Cuban crisis, uh, I can recall the tenseness, and it didn't last real long, but Kennedy had the good sense at least to call up Khrushchev before we had a nuclear war. And lo and behold, Khrushchev reasoned with the president, and he said, we put weapons on your border, you have weapons on our border. And he said, oh, that's the case. Uh, I guess we'll take some weapons out of Turkey, you take them out of Cuba, and they had an agreement, and it happened, and it was resolved. What's wrong with talking to people even when they're pretty different than us, and, and, and they don't, uh, they have a 